Okay, thank you, every, thank you everybody for coming today to um, welcome our authors and for their presentation. Um, we're doing a little in conversation with uh, Sophie Egan and Raman Ganeshram on their two books. Uh, so Sophie Egan is a director of health and sustainability leadership as well as the editor, editorial director for strategic initiatives at the Culinary Institute of America. And then Ramin Ganesham is an award-winning journalist, food historian, and professional chef, as well as the co-author of The Art of Perfect Sauce. Her work is notably and featured in The Guardian, NPR, Xavier, Epicurious, and Bon Appetit. She lives in Connecticut with her family. Um, Sophie will start us off here with a presentation followed by Remy. Great, well, thanks very much, Elise. It's great to be here, uh, virtually that is. Um, so I'm gonna share today with you the general uh, overview of what um, How to Be a Conscious Eater is all about. And I'll pull up some slides just to, to give you a little bit of a visual. So conscious eating, what it is and why it matters. Um, first, I wanted to give you the, a little bit of background on myself. Um, so I was uh, at the Culinary Institute of America in those capacities, but I actually work on food systems transformation from two major perspectives. And as you can see from this, hat, this slide, I wear a lot of hats. Um, but essentially, I'm trying to shift the food system in the direction of healthier, more sustainable, uh, more humane food choices by both um, bottom up, consumer driven, individual based um, changes, as well as top down from a systems level of policy and what companies are offering in the first place. So I support a number of different organizations through my consulting practice, which is called Full Table Solutions, and it's accelerating solutions at the intersection of food, health, and climate. Uh, I started that this business a year ago, and really the central problem I was trying to solve is that there are a ton of great uh, organizations out there doing lots of good work nationally, regionally, globally, all around food, health, and climate. But more often than not, this work is not coordinated, it's not measured, and it's not moving fast enough. So under the umbrella of consulting work, I am Senior Advisor for Sustainable Food Systems at R&DE Stanford Dining. I help lead a number of climate action initiatives and support longstanding racial equity initiatives. Uh, I also serve as co-director of the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative. This is a global network of over 60 colleges and universities using campus dining halls as living laboratories for behavior change. <coughs> Excuse me. We're working to uncover the most effective ways to shift people towards healthier, more sustainable ways of eating. All that happen to be extremely delicious. Uh, and then lastly, I serve as Director of Strategy for the Food for Climate League. And this is a nonprofit research collaborative whose mission is to democratize sustainable eating by changing the narratives, how it's talked about, uh, and ensuring that it's connecting with human, um, with people's most fundamental human needs. And then on the consumption side, I answer reader questions about food and health through the Ask Well platform of New York, the New York Times uh, Well section. And often I bring in an environmental or social lens that wasn't actually in the reader question. Um, and that's really the thrust uh, of, of how to be a conscious eater. And so you'll see that um, in many ways that experience answering those questions uh, shaped the book. I did just want to include this caveat, which is that the book is really aimed at this individual level. So this is a, a wonky academic framework called the social ecological model for behavior change. Um, but I, I include it to say that what I'm going to describe about conscious eating is how you can apply uh, the framework of how to be a conscious eater in your own life. But we have to, for actual systems to change, we have to really see the interplay between individual factors, interpersonal, organizational, community, and policy levers, um, because each of us individually is shaped by our environments and vice versa. Um, so, and we are shaping those as we make decisions about food, contributing back to food culture and to social norms. So the individual level here is the focus of the book, but it's not enough on its own. So I really hope that you all as readers will leave equipped and inspired to take this knowledge and competence from a household level um, out into your communities to support healthy, humane, sustainable foods in your schools, in your uh, employee food programs, in the community foodscapes of what options are available, and even to advocate for policy that makes it far easier for individuals to make conscious food choices than it is now. Because I think for most of us, it can feel like you're a salmon swimming upstream. 
So conscious eating. Uh, with this book, I really aim to empower eaters to align their food choices with their values. So in order to evaluate whether a food is really worth your hard earned grocery dollars, I suggest asking three questions. Is it good for me? Is it good for others? And is it good for the planet? To break this down a little bit, good for me means the whole me. Nutritious, yes, it's about health, but also personal dietary needs and restrictions. Joy, pleasure, nostalgia, comfort. Does it feed not just your body, but your soul? Good for others. This refers to all the people and animals affected from farm to fork throughout the food system. And this is in, con includes contending with issues like labor conditions for farm workers, animal welfare, wages, tipping, and discrimination in the restaurant industry, and well beyond. And then good for the planet. This involves making food choices that do not damage and whenever possible actually restore the ecosystems impacted by food production. So considerations like the long-term vitality of wildlife habitats, rivers and lakes, forests and fisheries, plains and prairies, and the ocean, as well as air quality. So reducing carbon and water footprints are central to this lens. And you'll see <clears throat> that mitigating pollution and greenhouse gas emissions are really at the top of that list. Uh, and, and we'll talk about what food can do uh, in that vein in terms of climate action. So one of the reasons I wrote this book is really to help eaters avoid the traditional, very siloed thinking when evaluating the merits of a food. Instead of just looking at it, you know, I'm really fixated on sugar content or nutrition profile and clean label, or I really, really only care about animal welfare, um, gaining a more holistic set of apertures. Um, a, a conscious eating is not a diet, it's a decision-making compass for the long haul. And my hope is that it can both, it can simplify the complexity because we all have information overload, decision fatigue, misinformation, and disinformation. Um, and instead this book offers evidence-based bottom line answers to top of mind questions. So to give some concrete examples um, of conscious eating in action, there is good reason for so much attention going to foods that come from the plant kingdom. So to give you an idea, I have the book uh, organized into four parts, stuff that comes from the ground, stuff that comes from animals, stuff that comes from factories, and stuff that's made in restaurant kitchens. And I start with stuff that comes from the ground because I go in descending order of foods to eat the most of. And foods that come from the ground are definitely the ones to eat the most of. And ideally we're talking about whole minimally processed foods here. So legumes, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, plant oils, seeds, nuts, herbs, spices, and so on. Um, this definitely hits the bullseye as far as many concurrent steps in the right direction of conscious eating. Uh, so personally, I'm not advocating for vegan or 100% plant-based eating. If that works for you, fantastic. Um, but Consumer Insights data suggests that a far greater number of people than are on a vegan or vegetarian diet are actually really open to eating plant-based foods um, and reducing red meat and, and meat consumption. And it's often called more of a flexitarian or plant-rich or plant-centric or plant-forward diet. Um, and I, I really think that is likely to resonate more broadly with the masses. Um, and, and part of it is the flexibility that's built into that flex term. You might have a vegan breakfast, a vegetarian lunch, and you know a little bit of meat um, for dinner. Uh, and so just having more, the, the most important thing is just that the overall emphasis in your eating pattern is on foods that are from the plant kingdom. Why is that? Because if you look at this great diagram from Barilla Foundation, you see that in, as a general rule, plant-based foods have a worse impact on the environment and a better impact on human health. It's that simple. Um, and so this is why I highlight this today because it's one of those sort of big takeaways from the book that like of all the things you focus on, this gets you a huge bang for your buck. Um, uh, so there's no social, you know, there's no animals involved. So no animal welfare issues to contend with. Um, so the impacts of industrial livestock production, not only on the livestock, but on factory farm workers, surrounding communities, those are also taken off the table. There's just a lot of win-win wins um, when you are focusing on, on these plant-based foods. And again, it doesn't mean that it has to be all or nothing. Um, and then an important caveat though, I'm often asked about this and I'll be curious to hear if Ramin is asked about this as well. Plant-based foods are not automatically healthier. So there is no question that they're better environmentally. Um, and there's absolutely a place, you know, it, 
it, it's just this reminder that there's a health halo that can come along often with plant-based foods. But I always like to point out, you know, a vegan cupcake is still a cupcake. <laughs> um, and so you just have to keep a, a, an, a clear eye uh, when you're evaluating these foods and, and also find ways to ensure that you're eating them in ways like what are they accompanied with, right? So eating an impossible burger versus probably one of the amazing dishes that Ramin's going to tell you about um, might be a different kind of total nutritional profile for you and, and will leave you feeling, you know, better uh, probably afterward. Um, so really Plant-based substitutes uh, are great because they're plug and play swaps for people. They're an easy way to change behavior, um, but they're not the only way, right? I mean, I mentioned a whole list of foods just now um, that are just inherently from the plant kingdom. And so really thinking about it um, as a whole menu, a delicious diversity of ways to emphasize those foods uh, from the ground. So there's a lot of complexity that I, in the book, essentially navigate the nuances of for you and then arrive at really the cut to the chase, top takeaways. What are these bottom line answers to those most top of mind um, questions? And it covers everything from sustainable seafood to how to read a nutrition label, um, to how to support fair wages for restaurant workers. So you also see that I essentially bring together a lot of other reference points that are out there um, and kind of point you in the direction if you want the deep dive, um, for example, sustainable seafood, you know, check out Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch program. Um, and then how to kind of cross-reference them Often they take only one of those lenses, only a sustainability lens or only a health lens. Okay, well, what if I'm, you know, trying to, uh, what if I'm pregnant and I'm concerned about mercury um, content, but I also want to eat sustainably. Uh, so a lot of the times the work that I've done for you is just cross-referencing them and helping you look at these food choices through those multiple uh, apertures. So to leave you here, I really um, just, dream of a world in which you won't need my book to navigate the complexity um, of food marketing, um, but really, and, and of the many different factors out there, um, but because the marketplace will shift over time so that the defaults are automatically nutritious, socially just, climate friendly. Um, and that's where those other levels that I, I started with, organizational, community, policy, all of those come into play. Um, but also from the market signals that each of us voting with our grocery baskets for the type of food we want available to us. In the aggregate, your individual actions do add up as a powerful consumer voice. And I really, really want you to, to hear that and embrace it um, with every meal that you have. Uh, but it's only when all of those levers and, and, and levels are really channeled can we reach that point when um, we'll be able to eat in ways that support our own health and that of the planet without even thinking about it. And, and then we won't have to call it conscious eating. We will just call it eating. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ramin and then look forward to a little discussion. Thank you, Sophia. First of all, I want to say that I love your book and I'm so happy to see it. And I have, um, <clears throat> interestingly, um, uh, a different kind of and similar co co connection because for um, eight years, I was the chief food strategist for a consumer market research firm. And we did psychographic research on consumers. You know what I'm talking about, right? Where futurism, where we basically kind of looked at these big food systems and looked at trends and looked at consumer behaviors at, to, to tell our kind of Fortune 100, Fortune 500 clients what was coming down the pipe. And when I left that job now going on six years ago, we were just starting to talk about plant-based eating. We were just starting to talk about flexitarianism. And, um, and what we found um, was that our clients, which were you know, CPG companies, you know, direct-to-consumer companies, were trying to navigate exactly what you just, just described, you know, this convergence, right? Is it always healthy if it's non-GMO? Is it always healthy if it's organic? Is it always healthy if it's plant-based? What about plant-based food that's made in a factory? What about you know, sustainably farmed fish that may have another issue, right? So um, it was just, it's a, it's a complex issue. And, you know, it's really great to have a book like yours to kind of at least get people on the path to start thinking about things holistically. And that's actually what I was talking about with my, with this book, the, the cooking with Beyond an Impossible Meat book. You know, people say to me, so, you know, this is, this is the solution for me to become vegan for whatever their reason is, right? Which is, it could be animal welfare. It could be, they want to eat, they, they want to eat plant-based, you know, whatever that may be, there may be food allergies, right? That this can help them solve. 
And what I always say is that it's not a magic bullet. It is, you have to look at this holistically, right? The, the truth of the matter is um, a lot of the, you know, beyond an impossible meat, it has a fairly high fat content, you know, and it's necessary for the mouthfeel. It's necessary to cook the product, um, you know, in, in the right way. Um, but understand that. So if you're on a low fat diet, you know, maybe you have gallbladder issues, whatever the case may be, maybe um, there's other reasons to, to be on a low fat diet may not be the thing for you. Um, there are plant-based dyes in these products, you know, generally not problematic usually, right? But there are people who have, who may have allergy issues. Having said that, these are wonderful products in many ways. Like they truly are, I have found a gateway to um, people who want to do plant-based eating, you know, who, who really, and again, you know, going back to your, 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 um, you know, your charts, culture is so important. And, you know, in the United States, we are very much, um, you know, a very center of the plate protein culture, the mouthfeel, the taste of it is something that we're accustomed to. And, you know, these products give this amazing alternative to that, that can just sort of get you on that road. Um, so what I did with this book, with cooking with Beyond Impossible Meat was, was two things. Kind of putting on my, that hat of a food strategist that I had for so many years. I said to myself, you know, there's another trend that we've been witnessing in the United States solidly, well, ever since the founding of America. I mean, I'm a historian as well. So, but very solidly in the last 20 or 25 years, which is that, you know, foods from diverse, uh, cultures and foods from around the world are more and more at play, even at, at the home dinner table. Whereas in the past, we would say, well, yeah, that's a restaurant experience more and more in part because of food manufacturers, right? You know, we are, there's a taste for heat, spicy food. There's a taste for, um, you know, Asian flavors. There's a taste for curry and this type of thing. So the beauty of that for me, thinking about that was, what is a way to use these plant-based meat products that is not just, here's a burger, here's some meatloaf, here's some meatballs, all lovely things. I'm not saying that they're not, but, but it doesn't lend itself to what, like what she said, what are you eating it with? What other vegetables can you put on that plate? What other whole grains can you put on that plate? So I started to think about it from that perspective. And I realized that, um, you know, Ground meats, whatever they may be, pork, beef, chicken, are uh, well consumed around the world. There are, you know, almost every food culture around the world has some ground meat recipe. And the reason is really simple. They're, they tend to be cheaper cuts of meat. They can be filling. They can be used essentially almost as a filler to something else. It can extend a dish. Um, so more people at different economic levels can engage with it. The result is that there's hundreds, if not thousands of worldwide recipes that use ground meat. And it's not just, you know, here's a lump of ground meat, but here's, you know, with many different vegetables and many different, you know, in a stir fry, what have you. So that's the approach I decided to take with this so that it was a way to get the whole plant ingredients into a dish as well, using this as kind of almost like the lure, if you will, if that makes sense. Um, so because of that, the book has things like, you know, kebabs five ways. And I didn't have to create these recipes. These are kebabs from around the world, you know, Syria and you know, Lebanon and Iran and India. And they are what they are. It's just instead of the ground lamb or the ground beef, it used you know one of these meat, uh, plant-based meat products. Um, there are dishes like um, you know wontons, right? Where you know the ground plant-based meat is that's what the filling is versus pork. Um, there are of course things like lasagna and as I said meatloaf and Salisbury Salisbury steak. And the book is divided that way. There's you know classic American comfort food, and then there's flavors of you know, East and South Asia, there's flavors of the Mediterranean, but it's a way to kind of get people to, um, to use um, this new comfort of flavors that we've become accustomed to as Americans um, to create, you know, 
diversity in this cookbook um, around around these these ingredients. So, um, you know, I have to say that working on this book, um, working on this book made these products a regular part of our diet in my house. My daughter's a vegetarian, and so I started to use them more and more. Um, but again, you know, being conscious of the fact that you probably wouldn't eat ground beef every day, right? So you're not going to eat, you know, necessarily ground and possible or beyond meat every day. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I just have to applaud you because I think this is so needed, this reframing of what, of what plant-based in this current moment in time can be, because one of the things that I've always had a pet peeve around in the past few years, as you mentioned, you've been immersed watching these alternatives and this whole industry like grow from, you know, looking nothing like the earlier generations, right, of Boca Burger and so forth. Um, but it's just seemed, it's felt so um, reductive or so boring. Like, do people only want to eat hot dogs and burgers all day? No. Like, yeah. Yeah. or nuggets, I guess is another one, right? And, right? and this idea that all we want as Americans is pucks, like who, who decided that? That's so lame. And from texture and mouthfeel perspectives, yeah. also just the idea that it's always gotta be some kind of a sandwich. It's like, okay, what about other day parts or what about uh, other cuisine types? So I just really, thank you for bringing that inspiration forward and bringing the history forward too right like there is this um this origin of, of especially when meat was scarce versus the very meat centric us um right. using a little bit as a garnish or as a condiment or as an extension for a meal to feed your whole family versus like the center of the plate or like hunk of protein you know spilling off the edges Right. So I just think it's so, so brilliant. I, I, um, as was mentioned in the intro, I do have, uh, experience working at the Culinary Institute of America. I still collaborate that, with them very closely as one of my clients. And I have culinary questions for you is, is basically my, my way of saying that. So first is what do you think are the, what's the biggest difference that people just from a technique perspective or from a, let's say you're a household chef and you're going through, uh, maybe it depends on if you're roasting or sauteing or things like that, but what's the biggest difference and you want in what maybe might surprise people is not different at all. Um, so the thing is, uh, these products cook a lot faster. Mm. Than, so that's, you know, a big difference, right? Um, so they do, they, they do cook a lot faster. Um, here's, I think what is surprising. They do not, uh, I guess maybe it's not that surprising because ground meat can be fatty. Um, they don't dry out that quickly because there is quite a bit of solid fat in it, plant-based fat, but so that's kind of surprising. I think, you know, the versatility is surprising uh, mm -hmm. to people as well, right? So you know, if you're cooking, even let's say ground turkey, it's gonna taste, that underlying flavor is gonna be ground turkey, right? What surprises me about these products is that depending on the spices and the herbs and the other things you're cooking with it with, it almost it almost morphs in a way. Like yes, you're gonna have that meaty taste, but um, it almost morphs and sort of absorbs. I think in a bet better uh, the flavors of everything else it's cooked with. Um, so I'll give you an example. There is um, one of the kebabs I mentioned. This is this ground meat, um, Iranian ground meat kebab, Persian kebab. My, my mother was Iranian, right? So um, so this is a really, it's called kebab kubida. It's a really beloved dish. It's made usually in like a, in a, a tandoor, like just like an Indian tandoor, which actually came from Iran in the, in the Mughal dynasty, came to the north of India. A lot of people don't know that it's no. Iranian oven. Yeah, so these kebabs are cooked in a tandoor. And they're delicious. So I actually haven't eaten red meat for probably 30 years. Um, and I've, I've substituted ground chicken, ground turkey for these kebabs. Um, and they're good. They're fine. But believe it or not, it's the plant-based meat that tastes more like the original. Hmm. Now I only make it with the plant-based meat. I mean, it tastes almost exactly, um, hmm. which is really surprising. 
um, but it does. So that so that was that was a surprise. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, and that's all that R and D that those companies put into just yeah. And really why these are the next? These are a completely different category of plant based alternatives than what came before them. Is that you know indistinguishability? I guess. But that's that's super interesting. Yeah, and kebabs is a fun example, just format wise. What about on it? Just you mentioning them cooking faster. Are there any applications that really they just functionally are not compatible with? Like, can you grill it? Or can you, you know, is it high heat, low heat, you know, certain sous vide, I don't know, like, are there certain cooking methods that just do not work? So, what is it? so you can grill it, but you're going to have to start out like on a piece of tin foil versus, you know, with a piece of actual meat, even ground meat, you could put it right on the hot grill, but you can't do that with this. It has to be on a piece of tin foil so it firms up. And then you can turn it on. Once it's firm, you can turn it on to the grill. Um, what I find is that, and you know, some are better than the others. Um, unlike meat, which can withstand multiple cooking uh, methods, mm -hmm. you could you could um, uh, broil something and then put it in a stew and simmer it. You know, brown it and then simmer it for a long time, like. This multiple, like the more more methods you ask, act add to it, it's going to break down. Mm -hmm. So another example is often what I will do, and there are a couple of recipes like this, where the original recipe had um, like a stewed meat, like a stew a meat stew mm -hmm. recipe. Um, I make little meatballs out of these out of the plant based meat, and I broil them to get them nice and brown, but you can't simmer in a really long time in that in that stew because it will start to break down. Yeah. So you have to, let's say it's a vegetable stew, you know, with beef normally, right? You'd have to do everything else, really get it to the point where you're just adding those little meatballs and cooking them for maybe, you know, five minutes, seven minutes. So that's really what they don't hold up to this kind of like endless, <laughs> you know, application. The evolution of the product over time of cooking is definitely different even if maybe in most cases the end result you can get like quite similar or the same yeah yeah um, i guess my last question is on I, I love all the different global cuisines that you mentioned is there a flavor profile that you found is especially suited or is it kind of like they're all perfectly you know compatible so long as you know what to do with them yeah i mean really that's true they're all perfectly compatible as long because they don't have that strong of an independent flavor I say it's basically a blank canvas right it really is i mean and that's that also surprised me like there are preparations that um for example um many chinese dishes that call for ground pork it needs ground pork because ground pork is actually milder than ground beef, right? And that's mm -hmm. going to fundamentally change the dish if you use ground beef instead of ground pork. You'd be better off to substitute ground chicken or ground turkey. Um, this is not the case with this. Like if it calls for ground pork, you could use one of these very easily because it just, the, the taste is, I mean, they do have a taste. I don't want people to think it just doesn't taste like anything. It does, right? It has a taste. It has a meaty taste. I guess the best way to put it, and to, in my experience, it doesn't have the meaty taste the way if, you know, if you were blindfolded and someone gave you a piece of chicken, you'd be like, that is chicken, right? Mm -hmm. Or a piece of pork, you'd be like, that is pork, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, with this, you'd be like, that tastes meaty, that has umami, but you're not going to be like, that tastes very much like lamb, you know, until it's seasoned and so on. Mm -hmm. you know, so what about an asset, it sounds like. It, yeah, it really is. It really is. It, you know, it could be not an asset if you don't want to be creative, right? If you just want to eat it as like a burger all the time, there's a point where we're going to say, like you said, the the puck of meat. I mean, come on, enough, you know, but, but, you, know, <laughs> right. but you know, what I wanted to ask you was, um, I'm really interested to, to know that in working on your book, did you find that, um, other world cultures, the way that they approach food was closer to this, like inherently closer to conscious eating uh, than American culture. And if so, which, you know, or what regions and 
um, which regions do you think are have the most potential cultural impact? Like, it's great if you say, yeah, in the tip of the Himalayas, they really have this down. Well, you know, that's, and I think that's amazing, but like, what is, what's likelihood that that's going to be influential in mainstream mm -hmm. culture? Yeah, that's an awesome question. I've never been asked that before, actually. Um, so what I'll say is that I discovered that actually in the research for my first book, which kind of led me to this book. And what I mean is that my first book is called Devoured, and it's all about the American food psyche. So it's this deep dive into American food culture and why we eat what and how we eat in the US. And it's very anthropological, psychological, you know, it's the the underpinning, the, the social science that underpins right. our relationships with food. And I, in all of the events and interviews and, and so forth that came with that book, fundamentally people were just like, okay, but should I eat coconut oil or olive oil? They just want to cut to the chase, like, give you the answers, enough information to make an informed choice um, that can actually be applied in my daily life. And the reason that that was sort of a profound realization for me was that it was so clear how deeply Americans specifically need this guidance. And as I've been contacted by people in other countries with how to be a conscious eater, I think that countries that are struggling the most are those that have the most similar to American kinds of, of, of culture. And for me, American culture is driven by three main values, work and productivity, individualism and independence, and progress and innovation. And that means a very forward-looking innovation and focused as opposed to tradition-based right. you know, pass, passing on your recipes and ways of eating from one generation to the next. And so that's like UK, kind of Northern Europe, um, Australia, for instance. But absolutely without question, there are many countries and cultures where a lot of this is just part of the fabric of their culture. They don't need my book or um, even to call it, say, plant forward. I mean, think of uh, one of the best examples is many regions of India where um, it, people wouldn't even identify to you, I'm a vegetarian. It's like, right. everyone I know is a vegetarian. <laughs> like, why do I even need to say right. anything about it? It's just part of, um, and and there are, the other main zones that are similar are blue zones, right? The places where people live the longest. So Japan um, and Greece and the, and, um, the Mediterranean certainly has that. The asterisk on all of those is the influence of American food. Right which has sadly exported. And so that's why we have to sort of undo, help undo the, the influence of American food culture on countries that already were eating in ways that were compatible with, um, you know, that were pro-environmental, po nature positive, that were good for human health and longevity, um, and that were treating animals well, because generally there just weren't that many animals involved. Um, live, you know, it wasn't, factory farming, livestock production at the scale that really only occurs in the US, right. um, or at least is the normal uh, way of, of eating meat in the US. So I think that those, that's really interesting to me is, is definitely both kind of, and, and there's a lot of conversation I will say happening in the United States about um, listening to, for example, indigenous communities who have long farmed in ways that are now called regenerative, but that were just, how farming occurred if you want to have land to farm on in the future um, in in not just in concert with nature but as one with the natural world right and and really uh, recognizing um, the ways in which many indigenous um, cultures and food ways um, that have been completely you know uh, taken over by very white western Amer American, food and, and food ways and, and agricultural methods um, hold a lot of those answers uh, for kind of uh, shifting uh, what, what happens in, in the U.S. context. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes so much sense. Like, I often think about the way we, we approach, the way we approach food in the United States, in my mind, is disassociative, right? And we do not want to be associated with the process. And, you know, as a historian, of course, we know why this is, right? Because the the laborers, the poor, the people who had to really be intimately involved in every moment of survival, you know, you wanted to get up into the middle class and upper class where somebody else did that for you. Mm -hmm. Well, food mechanization, industrialization of food made the somebody else 
you know, a machine that was far away that the, even the most, you know, middling or lower income person could remove themselves, could disassociate from that idea of, I need to grow my food and process my food and cook my food and preserve my food to keep myself alive, right? Mm -hmm. And I really think that it's, so I often think about this, like in terms of this psychology, this is one of the reasons why I really love plant-based meat because I think it actually is a disruptor. It interrupts that psychology or it actually uses that psychology um, for a better end or at least toward a better end, mm -hmm. um, you know? And sometimes I think, you know, is it trickery? Is, are you tricking people? And I mean, I don't, I wouldn't call it that because people know, they know they're not buying beef. Yeah. You know? um, but, you know, I do think that there's, there's a great opportunity there. Mm -hmm. um, to disrupt, you know, but I, what I also do say is that, you know, ultimately this is, you know, as you all know, this is food science, right? This is like, you know, a food chemist created this, you know, it's, it's, an, it's industrialized. It's, you know, it's not, it's, it's a man-made thing. That's not to say that it makes it bad, you know, but again, to your great point, it's that whole plant-based, you know, food um, that should be the base of the, the, the pyramid. It's like, you know, if you, I have one friend who says to me, I love her. She's like, I love you, but I'm not going to read your book because if I can't, it, you know, if the food doesn't look like what it is, mm. I don't eat it. Right. And so that doesn't look like what, like you're telling me there's, you know, pea protein and potato starch and um, mushrooms, all things I would eat, but not, that doesn't look like that to me. Mm -hmm. I'll eat the mushroom and the potato and the pea. And I'm like, that's fair. That's absolutely fair. That person is a purist. And that person is a purist, right? But for the person who's saying, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I will only eat a burger that tastes like a, a, like a beef burger. This is a great, great alternative. I'm going to say, I mean, that was the brilliant of impossible was saying our target consumer is the heavy meat eater. Yeah. You know, and that just, as you said, it was so disruptive and it is, um, I love the idea of really kind of leveraging the dynamics, the power dynamics that are ingrained and, and just kind of flipping it on its head, because this is one of the most important things that can occur. As we know, like I was saying about other, other countries, consumption of meat and red meat has gone up as people have entered the middle class and these have expanded in countries like China in particular. Um, but if you remove that as the aspirational thing for right. when you climb the social ladder, then it's like, well, oh, wait, I guess I just was already doing the right thing before. <laughs> um, and, and isn't that fascinating to, to kind of have that, that high low, uh, is, you know, interplay. I think it really is. And I think it's interesting. Like I often think about the price point of these products, mm -hmm. which I also think is a stroke of brilliance, right? Because I'm, you know, I'm not a food scientist, but I am a chef and I have worked as a food strategist. And I often think about the ingredients and in the process. And I always think like, what are the margins on this, right? Probably pretty good. Um, could, it, could, it, could they be less expensive? They probably could, but I have to say that I think it's brilliant that they are not quite as expensive as meat, really good meat. Like, you know, a, a package of impossible meat is about the same price as a package of grass-fed beef, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's brilliant. That's really smart because that's that aspirational piece of it, right? The person who wants to say, I have this thing that's really high quality because I deserve it, I can afford it, I've entered a level of society that, yeah. And then what my hope is, is that as they have created this aspirational product and more people, you know, have adopted it, they bring the price points down so that more people can make use of it. Like to me, I think, you know, that would be. Right. The idea. That tipping point, you know, culturally. Yeah, that's super interesting to, to track that over time. And, and it's, it reminds me of a lot of the work that um, throughout my time at the Culinary Institute of America, we would often hear from chefs uh, working in restaurants or, or food service that one of their biggest barriers to consumer adoption of plant forward options was the value proposition. Yeah. And the idea that, that I shouldn't be paying $10 for a vegetarian sandwich if I'm paying $10 for a 
sandwich with a bunch of cold cuts, like that should be like $4 or $5, right? And this idea that um, meat equals value. Yeah. Um, and, and so you're right, like putting it more on par with that as a marker of quality, as a marker of social status, um, and as something that you really are proud and excited, not like, oh, this is like the sacrifice item, <laughs> you know? Right, 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 exactly. You don't want it to be um, the sacrifice item. And I think, you know, to some extent, those previous products that you um, correctly mentioned, like the Boca burgers and corn and so on, I think they tried, but the, but the thing is, they didn't taste like meat. Right. They tasted like, you know, good vegetable burgers or whatever, but this product really tastes like meat, which is, it's amazing. I, I, and you know, it's funny, when I first started eating them, I thought, I want it to taste like meat. So that's why it tastes like meat. But in the process of doing this book and continuing to use these, I'm, I'm always just so kind of impressed and amazed that no, it really does taste like meat. It actually does. I have often made things for, my brother came to visit and I made a, a, a lasagna with it. Um, actually a lasagna with impossible meat and vegan cheese. He had no idea because even those products are become so yeah. such good mimics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you had no idea. This is really good. I really like this. <laughs> it's good because oh, there's no prouder moment for somebody cooking with those, right? Or for the product, you know, manufacturer, of course, is that I didn't even know moment. Um, sure. So I guess, uh, well, so two last questions for you. One is um, you mentioned the gateway idea and I completely agree. I really think it's important to people to see this as a tool in the toolbox. And especially when it comes to the urgency of climate change, the urgency of the chronic health crises upon us, we need every tool we can get. And so that's why people often ask me like, is it the answer? And it's, it's an answer and we need all of them is basically my approach. But I'm curious how you think of it. Like what do people do after they read this book or like, what do they, if it's a gateway, where do they go from there? Do they, have you, do you have any kind of anecdotal uh, insights into that? Well, I mean, I think that where they go is to then read your book so that they can really take it to the next level. So I they know going to say they start like making black bean burgers. <laughs> well, no, I think, um, you know, when I think about, you know, where do, where do people go with this? What I'm hoping is that, to, that so it's a three-step process. They use these recipes and they think, oh, these are different and creative and, and, you know, so the product can work for that. Then they start to experiment themselves with using these same products in their own ways. But what to me that achieves, and I say this as a chef, I say this kind of watching people behave with food and um, learning to cook. Once you start doing that yourself, once you start engaging with it, and you start trying new things, what you're developing is a different way of thinking about food. You're developing a way of thinking about ingredients differently and what goes with what. And then my hope is that makes them start to think more broadly about food at large. Mm -hmm. And then they branch out from there, right? So it's like a double gateway. First, it's the gateway <laughs> to get away from meat. And then it's a gateway to get into more creative independent cooking. And then the independent and creative cooking moves them maybe perhaps away from those products or, or less of those products toward other, toward other things. Um, mm -hmm. And, and creates discernment. Like, I think that's what we miss in this country is that we miss, so I, I find this very fascinating because on the one hand, um, we don't, uh, not entirely, but I would say that we don't value um, food traditions as much because we're not a uniform culture, right? So everyone's food tradition, we, we, we are a, a country of a la carte food tradition. Right, I like this because I was raised in that area. I like that because my parents were from this part of the world. I like this because my grandmother made it for me. My school cafeteria served that, like whatever it is, right? So we're this a la carte tradition country. So we don't have this kind of hard baked sense of food tradition and food culture that's uniform to everybody, right? You know, so 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 there's that there's that piece of it that makes it. Um, interestingly enough, actually opens up the playing field mm -hmm. 
to being able to experiment, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's kind of our undoing in many ways, but it could be this disruptive opportunity. Like if you're willing to build your own tradition, then you can really kind of move to that, that next step. And the other thing about it is that we generally don't like to cook in this country. Right. Right. And that's kind of problematic. So we outsource it to professionals. We outsource it to professionals. Yeah. You know? So that's the other thing about the, these products. They cook quickly. They're very easy to use um, because they mimic ground beef meat, which most people have used in their life. Um, it's a very low learning curve. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like saying here, you know, cook duck breast. Right? <laughs> that here's some quail. Like that's that takes some skill, right? So, right. yeah, that, those are great points. I, I completely agree. Okay, so my last question is, what is your favorite recipe? If you can even dare to pick one. <laughs> do you say, my favorite recipe, I do have a favorite recipe. I was hoping. And, and it's because um, it's something that I always loved and I found that the chicken turkey version of it isn't as good as well. And that's um, Caribbean beef patties, Jamaican beef patties. Mm. So my father is from Trinidad and Tobago. And what a lot of people don't realize is that those patties, they're essentially pasties. They're English meat pies, right? Like a Cornish pasty uh -huh. brought to the Caribbean by the English. Mm. And then spices were added to it for that like spicy beef patty and annatto oil, which, you know, you know, is the coloring in cheddar cheese. It makes cheddar cheese yellow and, um, is as that color. And um, it's common through the whole English speaking Caribbean, right? And even the French speaking Caribbean. Um, I really love beef patties, but I don't like beef. So I decided I was just gonna try it with this. And everyone told me that that's crazy, especially fellow Caribbean people. That's leave that alone. What are you doing? <laughs> that's insanity. Um, and I did it and it's, it's so good actually. I have to say this recipe is so good that I make probably 25, 30 of them every couple of weeks and just keep them in the freezer for a snack for my daughter. Oh and, my yeah. And then she takes them out, you know, one a day or every other day, she'll have one as a snack or her lunch and put it like in our little, in the little convection oven and hmm. make it. Wow. And it's perfect. Who would have thought? That's brilliant. <laughs> well, That's I love it. You like left it. no stone unturned in this book. It's just brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, thank you. Amazing. I can't wait to get cooking with it myself. And thank, thank you, you so much. Such a pleasure to speak with you. Really and... such a pleasure. Your work is so inspiring and, and great, to, great to connect with you. Thank you to Toadstool and to our viewers. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I actually have one question. Um, actually, two, because um, I know you guys touched on like pricing and everything. What about the stigma that plant-based eating is more expensive, even though it really isn't when you actually break it down to like what you guys said and everything? Yeah, so in, it really comes down to um, a couple of different things. There's, I think, the perception that plant-based eating kind of goes with the elite, like whole food shopper, you know, like, um, the kind of organic co-op type of natural mm -hmm. food, natural grocers, where things are quite a bit more expensive than uh, like more traditional grocery stores. And so often there's just sort of like the connotation of who is that for? Like who can afford it? Who is, whose lifestyle? They're like the Tesla driver, they're the whatever. Um, and so some of that actually relates to what Ramin was talking about, right? It's just, it's just the, um, uh, over time, like shifting, shifting food culture to just disband that myth, because it, if you actually do look at the comparisons, mm -hmm. uh, they've done data comparisons of like eating a vegetarian lifestyle or eating a vegan. I mean, it's dramatically lower, um, in, in part because, you know, beef is not cheap and, and a lot of these other products are not cheap. Um, the other thing I'll say on like produce specifically is oftentimes two things happen. One, um, people think you only have to get fresh whole produce in order to like get your veggies. And there are many more affordable ways. One of my favorite is frozen. Um, I mean, the price difference in berries, for example, especially if you're making something where you don't need them fresh, like a smoothie, or um, I like to have them for dessert. I just let them come to room temperature and 
you know, <laughs> it's a great way to eat out of season without being concerned about that, right? Um, the other is that it has to be all organic and that's definitely where you get these price premium um, issues uh, coming into play. And there's, uh, in the book, I provide kind of the dirty dozen, which is the 12 foods with the kind of most concerning from an organic pers perspective of pesticide uh, residues and the ones you don't really have to worry as much. So sometimes it's kind of just using your grocery dollars strategically in, in support of organic or not. Um, and obviously there are other reasons to support organic from an environmental perspective, but it's not as if you can only get your fruits and vegetables if you eat all fresh and all organic. And again, those are sort of just um, kind of some, some myths. So uh, I think that the data shows otherwise, part of this is perception. And then part of it is also just kind of um, looking at the other way is to make it more affordable. Another one I'll just actually mention is seasonal. Um, so you'll find that if you are opting for um, produce items in season, they tend to be quite a bit cheaper. You know, I'll actually add one, one um, sort of tip to that. You know, we talked about how other cultures um, tend to be by their nature more heavily produce based, more heavily, you know, plant based. And, and in many cases, you know, for non Western cultures, because of this very thing, the cost of animal, you know, animal foods is quite high. So the skew is toward plant based foods. Um, and so, um, you know, now in the United States, especially actually almost anywhere, but you know, with, with some exceptions, um, there are a fair amount of what's often called ethnic or cultural grocery stores. And that's often where you're gonna find your best bargains for that, that fresh food, right? Indian markets, Caribbean markets, Chinese markets. And um, you, the abundance of produce is staggering because that much of it is consumed. Um, and the price points tend to be lower than a traditional grocery store. Absolutely right. Yeah, completely agree. Um, and the other question I have is basically like with American culture and everything, everybody's used to getting things that are easy. And so things that are easier, are the stuff that would definitely not fall into what your books are talking about, obviously. How would you help somebody or what would you suggest to help somebody maybe get over grabbing that fast box on the counter on the shelf versus going for that fresh vegetables and you know the, yeah so so to more scratch cook, cook, you know? yeah yeah so i mean in ramin spoke about this i i actually delve into it quite a bit in my first book devoured which is there is such a lack of confidence in the kitchen um, in the US in part because it's just not valued as much as it is in other countries. So there's less time for it in the school day. There's less time for it in the work day. Um, it sends a signal that it's not important and uh, there's no curriculum. There's no sort of generational transfer of knowledge. Um, not none, but very little for many people. So there is a lot of anxiety. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do with it. I'm gonna bring this thing home, this kohlrabi and then what? Right? Like, how do I make dinner from that? Um, so this, uh, there are, there's my like one piece of advice is that there's no shame in taking some shortcuts to, to eat, you know, like if you want to um, get the pre chopped butternut squash because you're afraid you're gonna chop your arm off, you know, when you're breaking into the big squash and that there are some time saving, um, labor saving things that can ease you into cooking with real whole foods that is a great place to start um and, and i think some people have the sense that that's like cheating um but i'm a big fan of using some amount of prepared foods and building it in so like as an example you know tortellini that i didn't sit and make the tortellini myself um but maybe i build a meal around it i made a phenomenal lemon soup um like kind of inspired by like you know greek uh, golomino and and it was starting with some ingredients that i um did not make myself but it's a, as wholesome a meal as you can get um and the other things are really kind of fresh so it's essentially i would say is sort of look for some ways that uh reduce the um the burden and, and make it more like feasible for you to, to enter. Um, and the other thing I would say is just keep it simple. <laughs> Many recipes have 27 ingredients and 42 steps and that can just feel um, 
that can feel like a lot of places to go wrong. <laughs> and so there's also, I think, a, a high, we don't have to set the highest bar of like uh, what counts as, as cooking at the same time that you can, um, you know, get a few wins under your belt with, with some recipes that uh, have a few, that are just a little bit more simple and, and easier to engage with. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. And what I would also say is um, I often, you know, encourage people to, to basically leverage what has become, you know, cooking has become a spectator sport. It's become entertainment, right? In, 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 in our country where um, we may not want to cook, but we really like watching other people cook. We like watching food shows and, and so on. But so what I say to people is those food network shows that you love so much and, and you really get a lot out of, there's a, there's a clue there for you. And that is everything is already prepped out. Right, and that's what we call mise en place, right? And and you know the restaurant in restaurants, and so what I suggest to people is take you know even if it's only an hour or two hours on a Sunday or Saturday, whatever that day is, and prep the things you know for sure that you would you would be using. Are you going to use onions? You know, do a quart container of, of chopped onions, right? Are you going to you know use carrots? You put a lot of carrots in your salads, you know, buy the shredded carrots already shredded, you know, from the, you know, from the, from the supermarket and, you know, do that prep so that you can just reach in and grab, you know, peppers that are already chopped, or as you said, butternut squash that you bought, you know, cut from the supermarket or even Brussels sprouts cut in half. Um, and that can go for protein as well. You can roast a chicken on a Sunday and have roast chicken and then, you know, and the next day shred it and toss it in a whole grain pasta with a jarred sauce that, you know, um, you know, is made with really good tomatoes, right? And then all of a sudden you have a meal. So it's this idea of thinking a little bit ahead, you know, not making yourself crazy, um, but a little bit ahead so that it's easier for you. You're not making, you know, you're not coming home from work tired and now you have to start from scratch. Those are awesome tips. I'm going to take all of them. I love it. Um, right. Thank you guys so very much. Like that, I really, really enjoyed that presentation. Like lots of nice information there and probably when I'll even have them on the watch. So, um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for coming here. Yeah, thank you. Best of luck for me with the book and really appreciate all your work. Thanks, Toad Sewell. Thanks, Elise. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.